All right. So let's just pray. Lord, we just thank you again just for your time together as a church family and just to come together to meet with you, to meet with each other. Lord, to truly be the church, Lord. So, Lord, we ask for your, uh, your I'll just ask for your anointing, your quickening. Lord, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come. Lord, we love you. We want more of you. Amen. Our heart's desire is to know you more, to experience you in a greater way. So, Lord, we ask, even today, Lord, that you would bring those times of refreshing that comes from the Spirit. So, Lord, anyone this morning, Lord, who came in with a heaviness, or, Lord, with just the, the junk of the world that's on them from this week, that we just break it off in Jesus' name. And, Lord, that we would be, again, just anew and refreshed before you, Lord. We thank you for your word, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Today's title is C-O-T-R, Church on the Rock core values. Uh, you know, we have a mission statement. It's on the little sign out in front, and it says, knowing God and making Him known. Pretty simple mission statement, you know, compared to some I've seen that have been a couple pages long. But if you think about it, everything we do should be driven towards that toward knowing God ourselves and making Him known. Now, the, the first part of that, the first half, is knowing God. Last week, uh, Nathan spoke on, he said, be still, you know that scripture that says, be still and know that I am God. Because sometimes we bombard heaven with our prayers and we're, you know, we're, we're praying, we're interceding, but we don't type, you know, really take time to stop and listen. What are you saying, Lord? What's going on? Sometimes, you know, there's a, there's a stirring within us. They, there's something going on, and our emotions are, are raging, and, and we just can't seem to, to get peace. And that's when we need to sit before the Lord, and again, be still, let Him know, and let yourself know that He is God, He is in control. So regardless of what's going on in the world, whether it's Russia and Ukraine, whether it's out of control inflation, whatever might be on your mind and, and concerned about, it, it didn't take God by surprise. He knows what's going on. So sometimes we do need to just steal ourselves and wait before the Lord and remind ourselves the Lord is in control. Another part of that, of knowing God, you know, Jesse spoke two weeks ago on intimacy with the Lord and about relationship, how knowing God is all about a relationship with the Lord. And in order to have a relationship, you have to spend time with someone. It's like a, somebody in a marriage. If the couple never spends time together, they're probably not going to have too good a relationship. So there has to be communication both ways. Uh, Spending time, I, I always encourage people to have an appointment with the Lord. Set a time apart just for you and the Lord to be together. Because in today's day, we get so busy, there's so many demands, so many things going on. If you don't schedule it, it probably won't happen. And so we need to be intentional about spending time with the Lord. And we also have to spend time, of course, in His Word, because that's where we learn about him, we learn his character, we, we learn the things he did, how he functioned, what his heart was like. And so it's both spending time in prayer, spending time uh, just in that relationship, also in the word. It's that old saying, you know, that um, the spirit without the word, you are blow up, and the word without the spirit, you dry it. So we need both. The Spirit and the Word, letting that become known. Because one thing, you know, there's a saying is you can't export what you don't possess. And so the second part of this, of making Him known, we can't export that if you don't know it yourself. If you 
don't have that relationship with the Lord, if you haven't uh, come to that place of growing in the Lord, and that first part about knowing God, you never, you never graduate. It's a constant growth. It should be a constant growth. Now, sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. But it should be a constant growth in our maturity in the Lord. And so it's something that will be going from here actually into eternity. And from eternity on, we'll be learning. We'll be growing in the things of the Lord. But the second part of that, of making him known, is obviously is one thing is evangelism. Uh, it's the ministry to others in whatever different way that is. You know, I, I remember Jesse saying that he got up on, on a plane one time, started preaching to everybody in the plane. Well, that's one form of evangelism. I'm not quite wired that way, but for a, a lot of us, it, it's relationships. It's about getting to know somebody, developing a relationship, and out of that relationship, sharing. And a lot of times it is just uh, your testimony has incredible power. What has God done in your life that you can share with others? And when people see how your life has changed, then it opens them up and they're willing to listen to what you have to say. And I think especially as the times become more and more intense, some of the people maybe that you have tried to in the past, witness to or talk to about the Lord, really haven't had an ear but as things begin to intensify, all of a sudden those same people may be coming to you and asking you questions who, who didn't have the time of day for you before. So it is, it's huge, hugely important that that mission statement, knowing God and continue to develop, developing that in your own life and then making him known, touching others. And sometimes that's just ministry. Sometimes it's just, you know, giving a, a cup of cold water to someone, being nice to someone, reaching out, taking a meal, whatever it may be, even though it's not what we would normally call evangelism, you're doing the works of the kingdom. So, what are the core values that help us to fulfill this mission? Now, three years ago, Three, three years ago this month, so we're, we've completed three years, we made a, a, a huge change. We felt like we needed to go more back to an early New Testament church model. And so we began to look at that and, and look at it, what a team ministry would look like and just doing things differently. And there are four I've got listed four core values, and I'm going to kind of read those off to you, and then I'm going to come back and kind of each one of them develop. But one of the core values of the change was servant leadership. So servant leadership is number one. The second one is the five-fold ministry slash team ministry. The third was empowering the body to use their, gift, their gifts to build the kingdom of God. And the fourth one is praying and preparing for revival. So let's take the first one, servant leadership. I want to read a, a scripture out of Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, and this is right after uh, the disciples have been going on about who's going to be the greatest. And Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. And not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So there we have Jesus' example of him saying that I did not come to be served, but to serve. And if you want to be great, and you know it's not wrong to be great in the kingdom of God. That is a good thing to be great. 
But it's opposite the way the world does. The world tries to climb and tries to put others down in order to elevate themselves. But Jesus said the way to become great is to become servant of all, to serve others, to think less highly of yourself and more highly of others. You know, Paul was a tent maker. And we take from that, from our congregation here, that every leader, every you know, pastor, every teacher is self-supporting. In other words, we do not have a paid, you know, a paid staff. Everyone is a volunteer. And we kind of take that from what Paul did, and that's not to put it on anybody else, you know, on another church or anything like that. It's just that we think that that is a great model. That no one is paid. Because there is a scripture in John 10. I'm going to read real quickly. And again, as Paul was that example, he, he worked with his own hands, provide for himself and actually for others. But John chapter 10, verses 12... I go back to 11. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not a shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is hired, he is a hired hand, and cares nothing. For the sheep. And then Jesus goes on to say, I am the good shepherd. So we take that model that everybody is a volunteer, everybody has a gift, and that we, as a congregation, it gives us more flexibility and instead of paying salaries to pastors, that money can go towards missions, it can go through paying the building off, whatever it is needed. It gives us a lot more flexibility. And so we have volunteers in a lot of different areas, you know, whether it's cleaning teams, whether it's a cooking team on Bibles and Brunch, it's, uh, uh, you know, the worship team, all of them, you know, everybody, worship leader, teachers, we're all volunteers doing what God's called us to do and just believing that God's going to provide for each of us. Another thing is, with that servanthood model, there's an emphasis on the priesthood of every believer. So that is the opposite spirit of control and manipulation. Because sometimes in leadership you can have a a spirit that comes upon someone who then begins to try to control things or manipulate situations. And when you're emphasizing the priesthood of every believer, in other words, every one of you has the same access to the Lord as anybody who's standing up here. If you have that in your heart, then you're not going to see manipulation or control, that, that spirit of control. And that happens many times in churches. And it also removes the division between the clergy and the laity. There is no difference. There's not a professional class of clergy and then the rest of you out there. We're all in this together. We're all part of the priesthood of believers. We can all function in our part. And so it comes down to saying if you want to be a leader, then you need to serve. And again, there's plenty of opportunities to serve here. So I would encourage you all, if you're not doing something, get involved somewhere in serving in the church. Okay, the second one, second uh, core value, is the five-fold ministry. And we take that out of the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. I'll just read that quickly for you. Ephesians, chapter 4, and verses 11 through 16. And it's talking about Jesus. It says, It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers 
to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. So the Lord gave us prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, all part of that, that ministry. And, and what we find today in the modern church usually is you have a pastor. And you have someone who's trying to fulfill all five of those gifts, which rarely ever happens. I mean, they're gifted in a certain area usually. And that's why it's important that we incorporate all those gifts that are given to the church. You know, the team ministry, you know, by having even different teachers, you know, and sometimes there's teachers and there's preachers because there's, there's a little difference there in how that happens. But when we have different teachers up here, whether it's Nathan up here, Jessica, or when Scott was up here, whoever was up here, you had a different perspective. You have a different emphasis sometimes. And so you begin to get a, a bigger whole picture of the, you know, of, of the Lord and of, the, of his word. And it's a good thing because we all have our kind of blind spots. We all have emphasis, you know, that we think are the most important thing. We all have different styles, but different styles and different ways touch different people different ways. And so we need all of those different voices speaking. And so using the fivefold ministry, asking for those gifts and those things that we may be lacking, asking God to fulfill that. But the whole purpose of it was to prepare God's people for the works of service. In other words, it wasn't for the fivefold ministry to do the work. It was a, their purpose to prepare the people of God to go out and do the work. To deputize, you might say, yourselves, you've been deputized to go out and do this, the work of the kingdom. Now, the other one, number three, was empowering the body to use their gifts to build up the kingdom. And we've got a couple different scriptures I want to use on that. One's out of Romans. A couple different lists, because there's a couple different, depending on which list you're reading from. But the first one's in Romans chapter 12, and verses 4 through 8. Well, actually, I'm going to go back to three. This is for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with a measure of faith God has given you. Now, just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man is prophesying, if a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. And if it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is by showing mercy, let him do cheerfully. So it's saying that each one in the body has been given a gift. We all have different gifts. We all have different functions. But if we only have half of the body using their gifts, then we are, in a sense, we are handicapped because not everyone is taking their gifts and is using it to build up the whole body. And that's why it gives an example of, you know, if you're missing a hand, it's kind of, it does handicap you. And so that's why we need all the gifts, and part of our process is to 
to, to empower the church, the members, to use their gifts, to find out what their gifts are, and then to use them in ministering to one another and using them to minister to those outside the church. Now, the other scripture I had was in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we have kind of a different list. And I, I think I'm going to go ahead and read this whole chapter because it's all about that. It's all about one body, many parts. It's all about the different gifts. So let's just go through that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it says, Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. Therefore, I tell you, no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Now, there are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Okay? So, soak that in. Each one of you, each one of you have been given a manifestation of the Spirit that's given for the common good. Now, to one, there's there's been given the spirit of the message of wisdom. Now to another, it's the message of knowledge by the means of the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by, one, by that one spirit. And to another, miraculous powers. And to another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still another, the interpretation of tongues. Now all these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he gives them out to each one just as he has determined. Okay, verse 12 says, The body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all the parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Now the body is made up of one part, is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he has wanted them to be. And if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, these parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lack it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that each part should have equal concern for each other. 
If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now in the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it, and in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Obviously the question is no. Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret but eagerly desire the greater gifts? So we go through that chapter, and again it's making that point. Each one is given a gift, or multiple gifts. Everyone has been given a gift. And if you don't know what your gift is, you need to begin to find out what that is, asking the Lord. And many times when we start out in a gift, it's, it's like small steps. We, don't, we really don't know for sure. Say it's prophecy. You feel like you have uh, an impression that you need to, to speak to someone. Or maybe you see a picture and you're, and, and usually you're, you're kind of fearful because you don't know, is this, is this me or is this the Lord? And so sometimes you just have to step out. And you, you, know, and you just say, I'm just feeling this impression. You don't have to say, thus says the Lord. But I just feel this impression that, you know, whatever it is, blah, 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 blah. And just leave it at that. But as you begin to develop in those gifts, whatever that gift is, you grow in them. And it's the same with the, the fruits of the Spirit. You know, where gifts are given, the fruit is grown. And we need to increase in both of those. So we have these different gifts, but each one is needed in the body. Again, he gives that same picture of we need all the parts of the body. And one is not more important than the other part. And sometimes we think, well, I wish I had that guy's gift or that girl's gift. Or, and it's like the Lord put them in as, as he wants them. And all those gifts are just as important as, anyone, as any of the other gifts. So we need to begin to stir ourselves up and realize that as people begin to, to come in and as, as the, again, the times become more and more intense and people are looking for answers, people begin to come and the Spirit of God begins to move, it's not going to be people up here can do it. It's going to be, it has to be the whole body. Everyone taking their place, everyone, sometimes it'll just be picking someone out and you're going to say, okay, you're assigned to this person. That person doesn't know anything. Never, doesn't know John 6, you know, 316, doesn't know, have any actual background at all. And you need to be able to, to take that person and to begin to disciple them in the things of the Lord. And so it takes, it takes the whole community, it takes the whole church to be involved in that. So again, we, you know, we're building a church that is both a family and an army. So we have family together. We, you know, we, we work things out. We, we have a family. We love each other. We have times like Bibles and Brunch where we, we share meals together and just enjoy company. But we are also an army, which is, you know, offensive that we're going out. Now, the other one... The last one, number four, was praying for and preparing for revival. And let me go back one more step, too. In finding your own gifts, you know, sometimes when there's a need in a church, there's a something, so we always have needs of children ministry, cleaning teams. Uh, I'm sure the worship team would love to have some more worshipers and some musicians and sometimes we think well that's not my gift and so we kind of use that for an excuse not to serve so sometimes it's just a matter of that we need to be uh, willing to serve even though we can say well it's not necessarily my gift but there's a there's a need there and we need to fill that need and that doesn't mean you have to stay in that position but it's just a matter of 
of seeing a need and fulfilling it. Okay, number four was praying for and preparing for revival. Now, prayer has been a very important part uh, of this church body for a, a lot of years. We've had the watchman on the wall, which uh, for some of you I know are still involved in that. Some of you may not know what it is, but it's basically where you, we set out a specific time of day on a specific uh, day of the week where you would pray for an hour, praying for the church, praying for revival, praying uh, just for a set time, and, and we'd have people sign up, and we still have that, that ongoing. And that's important. We uh, also have the second Wednesday night, second Wednesday, Wednesday night of each month. We have a time, we call it the healing and praying for revival. So we, we have a, a time where we meet together, usually in the multipurpose room, and we pray specifically for healing and also pray for revival because it's, it's critically important that we begin to, to pray, to intercede knowing that God is going to move and we want to be a part of that move. We also, Sunday mornings, several of us will come in and, and we'll just pray in the sanctuary. And it's pretty cool now because the worship team a lot of times will be up here practicing, worshiping. And so we're able to pray and walk around and, and just pray and just have that, that, that worship soaking us, you know, which is huge in helping us in that prayer. So prayer is huge in this whole thing. Also, um, you know, I always have this picture, and my heart has always been for revival, believing that the Lord, you know, I've seen a part of some moves of God, but there's something more that's coming. And it's, it's, it's like I picture this as, uh, you know, one time we went to Hawaii and I tried to surf, and I remember I got this big old, uh, this was like 1978, and I had this, rented this surfboard, and it was like 10 feet tall, must have weighed 100 pounds, you know, back then in those days, and so I go, you know, I get it, and I, I go out in the surf, and, and I start, you know, paddling out, and I, I kind of watch for a little wave coming, and I turn, and I try to catch it, and it's like that wave just went right past me, nothing happened. I kept doing, I, mean, I was out there for an hour, two hours trying to do that. And by that time, I had drifted way down somewhere, probably a mile or two down the beach. And I, then by that time, I was exhausted. And then I had to get out, carry that surfboard back. By the time I got that, my surfing career was over. So, but, <clears throat> but anyway, I, I picture this because what a surfer does is... You do. You, you, you paddle out to where the surf breaks. You watch for the wave. And when you see that wave coming, you turn and you begin to paddle. You, you're cooperating with what's coming. And that's how I see revival. There's a revival coming, and we need to prepare for it. We need to begin to get on that surfboard and begin to paddle. Catch that wave of the Spirit as it's coming in, and let's ride it and just keep riding it. And, and we're just praying that's going to go from glory to glory. Not one that, that you know, comes and, then it, and, and throughout the history of right, that's many times it's happened, it's come and then it wanes and goes down. But one that goes from glory to glory. Sometimes man gets involved and tries to control it, and you can't control the Holy Spirit. You let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. And so I believe there's coming a mighty move. And with that, there's some practical things, like preparing the building for a great influx of people. There's some repairs that we need to do, so there's practical aspects of it, getting the building ready. You know, we've, we've been doing some painting, we've been doing some uh, update on the parking lot and getting it, you know, what's pre people can come in without falling in a hole. And, you know, some of those things and preparing the sanctuary here, we probably need new carpets, just different things to get ready to anticipate that as people begin to come in, that we're ready for it, physically and spiritually. And so I want to encourage you this morning to begin to think of that, those core values. Again, let me go over, you know, servant leadership, 
We're all called to be servants. And we lead by example. The fivefold ministry, using all those gifts to prepare the saints for the work of the service for the kingdom of God. Empowering all the body and all their different gifts and encouraging each one to take their place, to begin to serve in whatever way that is. And then praying and preparing for revival. And when revival comes, it may look strange. Because when the, when the Spirit comes in power, the strange things happen. People have manifestations. You know, I remember one of the first times, you know, where, where I was just really hit by the Spirit and just, I was just, like somebody plugged me in to the electric socket, you know, like, you know, but, and, and different people have different expressions of what happens to their body. Sometimes there's physical manifestations, sometimes it's inward, but it can look weird to people. Because people can look and go, what is going on? You know, what is happening? And we just need to be open to what the Spirit do, is doing. Welcome the Holy Spirit. Welcome the Holy Spirit to come and do whatever He wants to do. Knowing that lives will be changed by His power. It's not a, a program that we have that's going to change people. It's the presence of the Lord. Because when the Lord walks in the room, everything changes. Everything changes. And it's coming. There's a move of God coming. And it may look ugly in one way, but it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. And we need to welcome it. And it may be in the midst of a lot of things in the world going more and more what seems like out of control. But God is in control. And we need to remember that confidence that we have in the Lord. We may be surprised by some of the things going on. Again, but he is not surprised. It's all part of his plan. We don't necessarily understand it. Why he allows certain things to happen. Why? But when you get to heaven, you can ask him. Just know that he, he's sovereign. You know, his ways are much higher above our ways. And so the way we would plan it, I've told the Lord that before sometimes. You know, Lord, I really think I've got a good idea for you that, you know, da 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 da. And it's like, really? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> doesn't usually work out too well. So I think it's better if we just say, Lord, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, your purpose. We just want to line ourselves up with what you're doing. And so I just encourage you this morning to begin to pray, to begin to believe, to increase uh, your expectation of God moving mightily. And yet don't have a, a certain picture of how you think that, that is going to look because it's probably not going to be in the box that you, that you put it in. Um, and then, you know, after finish reading that, chapter 12, you know, 13 is the love chapter. And in other words, everything needs to be done from love. You know, everything we do is love. Now, I will say, as, as sometimes cessationists, just for your own understanding, will use uh, that chapter. Let me, well, let me read to you. Chapter 13. Uh, yeah. I'll start with verse 8. It says, Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Now, where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. Now, they will use that, cessationists will use, when the perfect comes, what they will say, well, that is this. It's, it's the Bible. So once we've got the Bible, we don't need those other things. We don't need prophecies. We don't need tongues. We don't need any of that stuff. But if you go on and read the passage, 
He says, when I was like a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then you will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So when we see him face to face, when he comes back, we won't need those gifts. But right now, we need everything the Lord has. And we need to be asking the Lord, Lord, equip me with everything that you have for me so that we can be the kingdom of God manifested in this dark world today. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have a time of, of, of a worship song afterwards. Anyone who needs prayer, feel free to come up, whether it's for healing or a relationship or for gifts, whatever it might be, feel free to come up and we'll pray for you. It's good to have Wesley back with us. He's has successful eye surgery, although he still can't quite see completely yet, but should be getting better in a few days. Uh, continue also to play for those who you don't see here today that may be dealing with some of the viruses and stuff going around. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we, we thank you for your plans. Lord, we thank you for the move of God that is coming. Lord, we want to get on that surfboard and we want to paddle. We want to see that wave and we want to catch it. And we want to ride it for all it's worth, Lord. So, Lord, we ask you. We come, Lord, praying, interceding, asking, Lord, for that outpouring of your spirit. Lord, for authentic revival to be released in our midst. Lord, one that touches hearts and lives, Lord. We want to be willing vessels, Lord. And Lord, we come this morning saying, Lord, less of us and more of you. And Lord, I ask, Lord, that you would just reveal to everyone sitting in this room this morning, Lord, what their gift is. That you begin to show them, Lord, what you've called them and how they are to function as part of the body. We can't be missing, missing body parts. We need the whole body functioning, doing what they do. So, Lord, we ask for your help. We ask, Lord, that you would empower us, that you would equip us. And, Lord, we ask for that intimacy with you. Lord, that we would grow more and more in the knowledge of you, of knowing God. Lord, that you would increase that in us, Lord, that we... Again, Lord, we can't export what we don't possess. So, Lord, we're asking for the fullness of all that you have for us, Lord. Lord, help us to set a time apart each day to have an appointment with you, to spend time, to ask you questions, to set, to listen, to study your word. So, Lord, that we would, that we would be ready for those who begin to come in to have answers to their questions. Lord, I ask for divine appointments for each one here, that as they're out, whether it's shopping or just in their job situation, Lord, that you would give them opportunities, Lord, and you, you would anoint them, and you would give them a word of knowledge or a prophecy or a word of wisdom, Lord, for someone they're, they're working with or someone they just meet. Lord, we need all of your gifts, Lord. We ask for the increase of your anointing. We ask for an increase of your authority. Lord, we want to minister to others in the power of the Holy Spirit. We want all your gifts, Lord, stir it up within us, Lord. Even right now, Lord, I ask you just begin to, Holy Spirit, stir up in their inward man right now, Lord. Stir, begin to fan into flame that, that little flicker and cause it to be a roaring flame, Lord. So, Lord, I ask, we're asking, Lord, for the fire of God. We're longing, Lord, set us on fire for your kingdom and your purpose. Do a mighty work, Lord. Renew our minds by the washing of your word. Give us prophetic eyes to see, ears to hear. Lord, help us, Lord. Lord, we are but flesh. But, Lord, there is no limit to your power. Nothing is impossible with God. 
So, Lord, we ask this morning, equip us. Prepare our hearts, Lord. Prepare our hearts, Lord. Give us that hunger within us, Lord, that we won't stop seeking you, seeking first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, knowing that all these things will be added unto us. So, Lord, come, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We want to yield ourselves to you. We want to empty our minds of, again, of the things of the weak, Lord, or concerns, and we want to be open to you, even right now, Lord. We want to be still and know that you are God. So, Lord, we ask for your help, even as we begin to, to worship in this last song, Lord. Touch us afresh and anew, Lord. We give you the praise. We give you the honor, for you are worthy, Lord. You are worthy. We say, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly, Lord. Come, Lord. Come to your people. Touch us, Lord. Touch us today, Lord. Hallelujah.